Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for joining us for our Whitmire um, webinar this morning. So first of all, our title was a little bit tongue in cheek. Hey, can you fix my headrest? Really what this um, total hour is gonna be about is making sure you start with the basics, that you start with the pelvis, that you work your way up that biomechanical chain, and then lastly, think about what you can do at the headrest. Um, that is going to really build in the success. Uh, sounds like I didn't have any sound, just doing a quick check. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on head positioning. Tongue in cheek, we said, can you fix my headrest? Um, realizing that the head is at the top of a sort of a long biomechanical chain. We must first think about the pelvis, think about the trunk, and then look towards the head positioning um, and and then you're gonna have a much more successful outcome. And we know why head positioning is so important. Um, it's really what connects us with the community at large, makes a, a big difference in our breathing and our swallowing. Also, all of our physiological functioning, such as our heart rate, our digestion, it's really how we communicate and learn with others. Obviously, if we have a good head position, we have a much better visual field. And within that visual field, that then allows me to communicate with others, to learn, to engage. And obviously, if we're having trouble with head control, those uh, neck extensors, they're really not meant to be static hold muscles. They'll be working over time. If you have sort of a forward head position, um, those muscles get stretched and they're not as strong in that really stretched position. So um, that's why it's really important to have that good head position. But I find it's one of the trickier things out there to actually accomplish. So hopefully we'll give you some strategies today um, and then some product application as well. Um, first of all, we really need to um, get hands on. Make sure that um, it's part of your assessment that you can um, look at the pelvis, look at the trunk, then put your hands on and figure out uh, really where that, that good head support should be. It's going to be like all the strategies that you use, use at the pelvis. Posteriorly anterior, what motions are available? Laterally, what motions are available? Where does that support need to come from? what sort of um, direction, what sort of shaping is required. Uh, make sure that you're looking at what active range of motion they actually have. You um, might wanna look at the passive range as well because it could be different. But remember that um, having a comfortable, sustainable head position is very, very important, okay? especially if we're expecting these clients to sit four, six, eight hours per day. Um, once you're putting your hands on, you're going to um, sort of give those forces which direction, what sort of shaping, what amount of pressure is required either to accommodate a head position or to reduce that head position. Remember that our hands can force modulate, <clears throat> they can change, they can offer multi-directional support, whereas a lot of these pads, um, they're much more static and they're not able to force modulate with our hands. So make sure that you're, you're taking that into consideration. We want to make sure that um, we're creating realistic expectations. Make sure that the family has realist, realistic expectations, the client. What can we achieve? What are the main goals? Is it pain reduction? Is it being able to sit longer in the wheelchair? Is it being able to eat um, in the wheelchair safely? or more safe. Um, setting sort of what the problem list is and then what, um, what's most important and triaging and then creating um, a solution list will be the best approach. Um, I find that some families will say, well, James's head is not straight. I really would need James's head to be straight. But a lot of times that, that might not be completely realistic, might not be functional, um, and it, it may not be comfortable. Okay, so again, we have to go back to our original problem list and goals, 
um, and look towards what can we compromise on to create you know, the, the good, the proper head position. And you know, sort of like our tongue-in-cheek title to the webinar, this isn't a magic pill. We can't fix a lot of heads with a particular headrest. It's really that foundation, the trunk, um, the wheelchairs, position in space, and then we're getting that support from the headrest. And then again, using gravity to assist you with um, getting, getting that head position. So can you change a back angle, seat to back angle? Can you change their overall orientation space, whether that be via a dynamic tilt in space system or whether that be with a fixed tilt in space? Okay. Well, basically, we want gravity to be helping us, particularly in that frontal plane, helping us maintain or attain that head control. Okay. Um, We've done previous webinars in terms of looking at the sagittal plane asymmetries, the frontal plane, the transverse plane. And I think um, the head position really um, follows those three planes approach. So first look at the frontal plane. What kind of, um, what kind of range of motion, what sort of um, ability for head position do you have? Can you alter that orientation in space in the anterior posterior dimension to help gravity? effect in that frontal plane. We'll see some case studies here along the way. In the sagittal plane, so that's your curvatures, can we use positioning, positioning at the suboccipital region and also positioning at the thoracic spine to help create a better midline head position. And then rotational systems, you're going to be looking for sort of a suboccipital and some sort of temporal or frontal um, to reduce that transverse, that rotational head position, or to hold it, right, if you need to accommodate. Okay, so make sure that you're using the angles of your mobility device, angles of your seating system, and then again, looking to where those postural supports need to be at the actual head. Here's a good example of a very forward head. Um, they're tilted in this chair, right? We've got a fair bit of tilt happening, but we still have gravity um, not giving us enough support to get that head into a better alignment, again, in that sagittal plane, sorry, in that frontal plane, so forward head position. But if we then change the seat to back angle of the wheelchair, in addition to the tilt that's already in the system, now you can see we're in much better alignment. You can also see that um, uh, tone has been reduced. She's not fighting against gravity as much. So we've got more of a gravitational pull that's allowing us, or push really, allowing us to stay better into that headrest. So again, a combination of the orientation space of the wheelchair and the opening of the seat to back angle. Okay, so gravity can assist us. I think the other thing we really need to remember is that we're looking at the causation of the head position. Though even some of these case studies that I'll show later on, we see the head in a really crazy position. We wanna just move that. No, you gotta go down the biomechanical chain and look for what's actually causing the head to be in that position. Most typically, that's going to be in your pelvis, that's going to be in your trunk. So sort those out first. And I know I'm sounding like a broken record, but um, it's very tempting to start at the head and just start to put, even simulate um, postural supports there. But nope, go back to the basics, go back to the foundation. Where can you get a better position of your pelvis in all three planes? Where can you get a better position of the trunk? or maybe just a hold position in the trunk and then look towards that head position, okay. So we see that we have um, poor head control, um, primarily in the anterior, posterior, or lateral dimension. We can also see um, neck hyperextension, uh, sort of what we saw in that um, previous picture, 
where we're just jutting forward because we're trying to gain control. And obviously not having these this head in a good midline position is really gonna affect their physiological functioning. Not gonna be able to eat well or safely. So much more um, issue of aspiration, getting food down the wrong tube. Obviously, um, if we don't have that good head position, we might cut off our, our, our trachea really. And so we have trouble taking deeper breaths. And I find that a lot of people with a poor head position suffer from migraines or headaches or overall discomfort. They just can't tolerate sitting in the, in the chair the, the like the time that they'd really like to. So really think about looking at the, the actual cause of that, start at the pelvis, and then look at um, the trunk's position. So commonly we'll see an obliquity of the pelvis, so one side lower, which will cause uh, scoliosis at the trunk, and then that'll cause a lateral deviation at the head. If we have a very low tone, sort of a floppy sacral collapse, sacral sitter, we're just getting that really nice curve that's going to end up with a forward head position. Whether we call that a, um, a gibbous sort of deformity or a kyphosis, all that means is that we've really gotten that head in a forward position and it's going to be very tricky uh, to manage without some gravitational support or even some anterior support. It's very far forward. Um, last thing too is um, make sure that you're considering whether their head position might be based on some visual impairments. Um, if they have a cortical impairment or um, sort of a field cut or neglect, they could have that head position so that they are trying to more normalize their visual field. Okay, your, probably your speech therapist or maybe even um, the medical doctor could help you with that visual field portion. Um, very common, um, we'll find that they have like a midline shift problem. So obviously they'll, they'll see not the text like we would see it, but it gets fuzzy and they can head, move their head back. Okay. So that just consider that might be the actual root cause of, um, of some of their um, head positions. Okay. Very important, just to give a, a quick check or ask their medical professional, um, do we have any, any um, cortical field cut or any visual impairments that we know of? And then before just adding pads, before just going for a bigger head support, make sure that you're trying to create as neutral a pelvis as possible. Okay, in all three of the planes, obviously. Make sure that you are maximizing the use of their tilt system whether that be a dynamic tilt or a fixed tilt in space. Also think about opening up their seat to back angle, okay? but realize that's gonna have ramifications perhaps on tone, perhaps on spasticity. Obviously it's gonna change what they're looking at. So now we have um, sort of, you know, they're looking more at the ceiling or above people's heads, depending on how much tilt, how much recline you put into the system. And then you also might wanna consider adding some back angle to the system. So seat to back angle is going to change their hip angle. The back angle is going to change, um, bring them hopefully into a little bit of thoracic extension. Okay, so all three of those sort of orientation and space can help with gravity assisting with head control. And I already spoke about um, making sure that you know about their vision and um, making any any professional sort of referrals that you need to do there. So when we're looking at headrests, and um, we'll look at all of the systems live uh, behind me when we finish with the slide deck. Um, typically, we have options for what we call the mount. So that's the stem of the thing. Yeah. So we can we can choose that, or we should choose that based on durability based on um, how far forward or how far backward you need it to go, what height you need it to be, because these are all going to adjust a little bit differently. Um, also, you might wanna choose your mount based on a little bit aesthetics, but also in terms of functionality, maybe they've got lots of care, so you don't want big poles sticking out behind them. 
Right. So durability, functionality, and position is how I typically will choose the mount. And then the pads that are on top, again, we'll look at those. You can choose your amount of pads. You can choose the thickness, the softness of the foam, and the, the shape, the contour of that pad. Okay. Um, probably most important is getting that headrest in the right position to offer the support that you've decided that the client requires. Then we'll also have to have it be user friendly in terms of that functionality, right? For transfers, for getting close to the client, for pushing the client, maybe if they're in a, a passive chair. So that'll be sort of the size and the, the functionality of it. Um, us clinicians want it to be easy to adjust, but it also might be very important that it, it looks um, like something you should not fiddle with. I think a lot of parents may take their Allen key around and they'll say, well, I'll just tweak it this way, tweak it that way. Some clients, you may not want that to happen. So if we can um, sort of hide some of those adjustment portions that might suit our needs better, depending on the client. And obviously we always want the um, system to be durable. So that's useful for years to come, stays in good shape, stays in position, yeah, um, and um, parts in the foam and fabric um, is durable for the client. And I do often feel that less is sometimes more. I will try and do a simpler headrest system if I can get away with it versus a complicated multi-pad system because no matter how great we make these headrests, no matter how tight we make the fasteners, it just does um, come out of alignment. You know, it just needs a little bit of um, um, making sure maintenance, making sure that it's as it's meant to be every couple weeks, okay? So sometimes less is more if you can get a good enough head position. And these are the different headrest mounts. Um, we'll take a look at these um, in the actual products, but I'll name them here. Um, going from right to left. The Pro, you'll find that this one is actually in the Whitmire kit. So some of you may be familiar with that. We use it in the kit because it's really adjustable. You can get almost any height and any length forward or backwards. Plus it's really durable. But for client use, I would use this for a client that um, may be very active. They have a lot of spasticity. Um, a lot of pushing back on the headrest, and I really need it to be very strong, okay? Otherwise, I might go for some of the smaller, more aesthetic mounts. Word of note, if you're a pediatric therapist, this pro mount will go right into the Lecky sitters and standers. So that'll go right into the receiver, and then you can put whatever Whitmire um, pad on there. So if you needed a, a more uh, positional headrest on some of your Lecky products, this is a really easy way to do it. The Onyx, I only use um, maybe with my pediatric or on my little zip back uh, because it's the lightest, it's the smallest, but it does have round tubing. So as kiddos get bigger and push more and more activity, I find that this one doesn't hold as well as its square counterpart called the Axis. I love this Axis because it gives me lots and lots of adjustability. It can be offset. Um, from left to right, it can go really far forward, it can go really far down, it's, it's um, uh, very durable, it holds well. Only thing to consider is if I've got somebody, um, a care that's pushing from the back, it can sometimes have a stem sticking out the back, which can poke them in the belly. And if that's the case, and I need a ton of adjustability, really good durability, nice looking, but with no stomach poker, I will go to the Lynx, sorry, the Lynx 2, which is this guy. You'll see that these look very similar, the Lynx and the Lynx 2. The difference is the Lynx 2 has an extra link here so that it can go really far forward and really far down at the same time. It can go really high up, it can go really far forward. So this one has heaps of adjustability with no stomach poker. We also use these on our power chairs. So that's telling you that they're super durable, um, really easy to use. So those are both really great systems, the Lynx. Difference being the Lynx 2, 
um, will have more adjustability, a little bit like in a mechano set, hey? Okay? You have the extra linkage that will get you those in-between places in terms of I need it low but in forward or high and a little bit forward, okay, versus the links. And then we make um, the Cobra and the Cobra flip back. These are our um, slimmest, lightest, most probably aesthetic system. Um, has a fair bit of adjustability in terms it can go forward. Again, I'll show you these in live. I also like this Cobra flip back. Has a little button here so that the top of it will flip back um, so that you could easily get to the system, get that headrest out of the way for transfers. Okay. We're going to choose the headrest mount based on durability, based on um, position that we need, where we need the head pad to actually be located, um, ease of use, and then the functionality, like, hey, what, what do my carers need? Do we need it to flip out of the way? Um, do we need it to be really small, sort of um, in the back? We'll take a look at those. And then in terms of the pads, we obviously have lots of different pad shapes, but first let's think about where we might want to support. Um, the occiput or the bump in the back of your head is really where we're trying to place on the pad, especially in that sagittal plane that, um, <clears throat> keep saying that wrong, sorry, the frontal plane, um, anterior and posterior dimension, right? We're going to try and just sort of scoop on that occipital um, bump and offer the support there. Cradle is what it says here on the, on the slide. Okay, and then depending on how much lateral support you need, um, how much anterior post, uh, sorry, superior inferior support you need, we can choose the pad size. That would be your, your occipital or your suboccipital sort of pad. If we're doing multiple pads, that's when we're going to go below the occiput to the suboccipital, and then we might also put another. Um, pad up above it. So this is meant to cradle your suboccipital pad, is meant to cradle sort of your neck, go below your ears, and then you'll have um, an occipital pad, probably smaller if you're doing multiple pads, a little bit smaller than if you just had your occipital pad here. Obviously if we're doing these multiple pad systems here, it's because I need more support, I need um, that suboccipital to give just a little bit of a lift, not like traction really, but that sort of movement or moment that's going to help with the head position. And then gravity is going to help me sort of cradle that head. And then the occipital pad will, um, will support the rest of the head, okay? Sort of give it a resting place. This picture on the uh, left here, that's a multi-pad, either a two or three at the suboccipital sorry, either a one or a two at the suboccipital region and the occipital pad. And this picture is of the heads up. Um, this is a, a headrest that gives lots of anterior support so that we can help um, create a, a more neutral head position, most useful for kids with, with droopy heads, losing it forward. We can also add lateral supports. We have, you know, sort of a head curvature. Remember that we're able to put it on the temporal area. We're able to put it on the frontal area, but we're not able to put it at the TMJ, the mandible. Okay. That's not a surface that's supported. Okay, it will create pain um, and obviously affect their ability to eat and to communicate. So it's really good to go into that temporal. Anywhere that's flat is easier. Well, a lot of our clients have more rounded surfaces. Hey? Um, or you could put it on the frontal um, to give you that lateral, lateral, anterior sort of support. Okay, obviously the eyes are off limits. Okay, as is the ears and that mastoid process. So we want to go just a little bit below that mastoid process. We can't go on the mandible or the jawbone. So those are the areas that are off limit, but we do have a really nice, hopefully, surface here, the temporal bone, or even if you need to come a little bit more frontal to the um, frontal portion, um, and then suboccipitally, 
and oxygenate. Okay, we'll look at that in in um, real life here in a moment. Let's take some examples. If we have somebody with um, poor head control, sort of forward, they're just dropping their head position there. Um, remember that it's really starting with the pelvis where our corrections will happen. So think about um, getting that pelvis into neutral. So can you add a sacral pad, a sacral block? Can you add an ischial shelf or some sort of contouring to your seat, seat cushion? Can you change their orientation, their tilt, their seat to back angle, their back angle? Okay, your anterior pelvic belt, have that be helping you rotate that pelvis more into an anterior position and to um, stop any sliding or shearing forces. Don't forget the importance of an armrest. If you have arms that are supported in a more up and forward position, that'll help you with a little bit of shoulder retraction and allow that head, a little bit of shoulder retraction, a little bit of thoracic extension. That'll help to stack that head on top of the body. So you'll minimize the gravitational pull forward. Okay. So that's really what we're looking at here. If I've got a passive issue, passive issue forward, or maybe even a little bit to the side. And for this sort of head, lastly, we'll look at a head pad at the occiput in sort of a little bit of a lift, but that posterior to anterior sort of force. Thinking about passive, um, you know, non-tonal um, loss, of, loss of head control forward. If we then think about the same sort of head position, but more active, so now it's it's spasticity, it's an abnormal reflex. Okay, now I want to think about a little bit higher backrest. Okay, I want to think about trying to get that pelvis um, a little bit more um, towards neutral, maybe even a little bit posterior. So here my pelvic belt is going to be moving the pelvis or trying to get the pelvis to move toward posterior rotation. Higher back support to bring the shoulders a little bit forward, a little bit creation of flexion towards the front. My armrest will be a little bit lower. So again, I can create more of a flexion sort of movement. Um, still want that contour to my cushion just so that I stop the sliding forces. And now I'm gonna use more of a anterior, sorry, um, more of a suboccipital sort of pad here, and then a higher occipital pad. So I'm trying to create more flexion, so those forces are just a little bit higher um, and creating that want to move the head towards a forward position. Obviously, a lot of these people are also going to have um, a lateral component, either a lateral tilt or lateral rotation. But we'll take that in the next step. We're just looking at that extension again in the frontal plane. Okay. Um, also, think about where you want to position that legs so that you're getting some really nice support for that. If you've got a lot of extension um, movement, a lot of extensor tone, you may want to. Um, increase your knee flexion. You may want to increase your dorsiflexion. Also, don't forget about um, the possibility of an anterior thoracic support. And remember, these are secondary supports. They're the things that you add on last to help. But that uh, sort of a midline um, chest harness can help you create flexion at the trunk. Okay. All those things are going to stack up so that then you have a much better chance of getting that head into a, a better position, okay? So really, get that pelvis, broken record again, get that pelvis in a good position. Here with that active extension that we're trying to reduce, we're gonna wanna promote flexion. So a higher back rest. Make sure that your anterior pelvic belt is pulling more towards the back because it can create the pelvis wanting to move into a little bit more posterior rotation. Arms a little bit more forward and lower, and then try a suboccipital and an occipital pad. 
If we then now look at adding a lateral component in the passive orientation, now this might be very useful to add a pad to the side. And if you can come to um, symmetry, then you can have just a one pad system for the suboccipital pad. But if you're a little bit asymmetric, you need more pressure, um, a different level of pressure, a different length of pressure on one side, you might want to have those two suboccipital pads different. I'll show you that when we get to the product so that you can actually rotate them and, and offer that um, those pads where they need to support. Okay. And then do all the other things that we talked about with that passive extension position. Kind okay. of think about um, tilt, think about back recline, seat to back angle, back angle. If we then look at this with some tone put into the equation, now we've got an ATNR or we've got um, just um, higher tone in that direction. Here's what we're trying to simulate as an ATNR, asymmetric tonic neck reflex. Then during your simulation process, you're gonna find out via your hands where those pads need to be, sort of the angle of them, the location of them, the length, so that we can offer that support to either hold that posture or reduce it and bring it closer or to midline position, okay? But here we're simulating those, um, those dual suboccipital pads. Remember that they're gonna, they're gonna cup, sort of cradle the neck, make sure that they're not on the TMJ, make sure that they're not on the mastoid process, Make sure they're not on the ears, okay? Cup that. I always start with these lateral pads first so that I can get those in a good position. I, um, just a little bit of a cupping, just like your hands during the assessment, really that's what those pads are meant to do. A little bit of a lift, little bit, little bit, and then put in the occipital pad so that it can help support, sort of cradle that head, take the weight of the head, right? And if you need some lateral pads, or frontal pads, both, those will be um, located where you need your pads um, to create those forces to change the head position or to hold it there. Um, my little graphic designer was just giving this guy a wink. Um, we, haven't, we haven't injured his eye with the use of the wet mire, so that's just us winking at you here. Okay. Also remember that the head is on top of the trunk that's on top of the pelvis. So if, you, if you've got a pelvic obliquity, use your pelvic obliquity, um, hopefully to correct that pelvic obliquity. Then you're gonna use your lateral support to offer trunk support for your, you know, some support for your trunk. And then that lateral thoracic can be the opposing force for your suboccipital. So you sort of are able to, to use lower down positional supports to help the head position. Okay, and here we're showing that we can actually use um, an anterior harness in terms of that derotation or the elevation, which will also help um, the head position, okay? So it's all stacking up and, um, and helping us create that better head position, okay? That's what the system would look like um, from the back realizing that we are really trying to follow the curve of that spine and either reduce it or hold it. Um, your force modulating is it's gonna tell you sort of where you need those, those um, wings, the, the suboccipital pads to be. So one might be lower than the other, just creating where that pressure for hold or reduction of the head position needs to be. And then make sure that you are offering support um, to the head, to the occiput as well. Okay. It takes sort of the, the real weight of the system. And then your, um, your lateral pads, frontal pads would be there, okay. It's really where I, I feel like simulation, having things to try uh, really makes this process um, much better. Here's a, a young lady. Um, this is sort of a quiet position for her. She had a fair bit of tone and abnormal reflexes. And when she tried to um, talk or communicate, those got even stronger. So I've got really nice pelvic position, really good trunk position. But then we um, really needed to have some suboccipital to, to cradle the head, really create the neutral 
And then because she had both a rotational and a lateral tilt um, movement, sort of active um, tonal pattern, um, we used um, a pretty big, I'll show you these pads in a moment, a pretty big pad that was um, temporal to frontal located that offered her some really nice support, okay. really good positioning. This can swing away so that when she um, uh, needs to get out of the chair, it's a quite easy transfer. There's a side view of her. You can see better where those position, those um, pads are positioned. And, um, I love this picture because she's actually um, a little bit more attending. You can you can see she's more relaxed and she's able to at least participate a little bit. She's telling us how she's going here. Okay, it's a great outcome for her with a three pad system with a swing in. A lateral temporal pad. Uh, last sort of um, uh, deviation asymmetry we need to think about is the rotation. And again, it's going to be in that rotational plane. So you obviously, um, if you need to derotate, that's going to have to happen from the sides. Okay, to derotate, have your trunk position help you with that derotation. But we also need to understand that if there's some fixed, if there's some um, non-correctable deformities in here, that you're just going to transfer that rotation down to the trunk. So maybe, you know, if it's not fully reducible, um, you'll derotate the head, but it'll come to the trunk with that rotation. And we really don't want the trunk rotating then you have all sorts of issues with physiological functioning and um, respiratory space. You can see here that it's already starting to deviate the, the ribs. Okay, So making sure that you can't just offer support, derotational support to the head, especially if this is sort of a long-standing asymmetry, we need to add the forces to the to the lower body as well okay to that trunk position and that'll be the derotation forces that you'd use at your pelvis so so if you had a pelvic rotation you try and move the back side forward pull the forward side back and then same thing at the trunk you've got to have those derotation forces there before you look at derotation of the head space okay Again, hopefully this theme is showing through that we really need to start at the, the causation of the posture, which is very typically going to be the pelvis, the trunk, and then the head is going to be a, a really graphic symbol, um, symptom of that um, asymmetry down below it. And then we put the anterior support to sort of the last option here because we want to do all the other things first. We want to look at the pelvis position, the trunk position, look at um, our deviations in terms of scoliosis and lateral. And we want to look at supports that we can offer laterally before we offer supports anteriorly. But we realize that they are useful um, in the correct cases. So we offer quite a few different kinds. Um, to best suit the needs. Um, probably best known for the one that we started with is a dynamic forehead strap. So this will add on to any pad that you'd like. And then it's on a little pulley here and a fabric forehead strap goes right here. And so the client just gets that anterior support and can still move their head because of that rotational pulley system. Uh, we can add a little hat to it so that we can cover that we're actually having a forehead strap. They can put their favorite AFL or rugby team or whatever basketball team on the cap. Also makes the cap or the forehead strap stay in place a little bit better. Um, we also now do what we call the DFS2. This is a more structural version of this anterior support. So these are actually um, like uh, poly sort of material, so they're more structural, they're a little bit stiffer, and then a very nice fabric strap that again puts on to the forehead here, and that will offer a fair bit more um, strength to the anterior support, and also more structural, so it stays in place a little bit better. Okay. 
and then it flips back here so that you can get it out of the way for when they don't want it when they're resting. Uh, last version here on the slide is what we call the, the heads with a Z, heads up, or the static forehead strap. That's not meant to actually go on the forehead. It's more of a reminder. So the person loses their head control, and they can come forward from it. So it's just meant to be a reminder, hey, pick up your head, pick up your head. Okay. Not meant, this is a much more structural. It's a stiff material with padding on the front here. Um, so not meant to be resting straight on the forehead. These are all great um, add-ons if you really just need that last bit of, um, of control in the anterior dimension. You've ma maximized what you can do with the pelvis. You've maximized what you can do with the trunk, tilt, back recline, arm position. And you still just need a little bit of a force there at the, at the head. Realizing that you can also put a real pad there if you need even more structural integrity. Okay, and I'll show some examples of that in a moment. Um, the other anterior support that I'd like to talk about is the heads up, and that's here. And this is um, really looking at the extension of that suboccipital and occipital pad that we've been talking about. But now built into the system, it has an anterior chest component. So that's get my suboccipital of the um, head rest here is giving me my suboccipital, and then I've got my alternate my opposing force and my chest. And then I can also add a chin prompt, which will limit or serve as a reminder the amount that that chin drops down, okay? And it nicely cradles the head, offers that occipital support as well. Um, I find that this system works the best with passive sort of head drop, um, with the kiddo just, just um, they get tired at the end of the day and they're not paying attention, we just need that built-in anterior um, to help get the, the head into a more neutral position. Um, I find that if somebody has a, a ton of tone, um, abnormal reflexes, it might be better to do an actual pad at the forehead. Okay, I'll show you some examples of this. Um, here the pad is um, built in, so it just um, cradles the head, there isn't a separate pad. So I imagine with this system that we need to have a pretty symmetric um, shaped head. Nice bit about this system is that it actually has release buttons on either side. Can't see them here, it's a little bit easier here, where you push that button and then the little wings flip out of the way. So it makes um, transfers in and out of the system much, much easier. Okay. Um, that's one of the benefits of this is heads up. We've made it um, easy to get in and out. Um, here, if I needed separate uh, position for that upper portion, because I have sort of a funny shaped head, um, it's a little bit further away, or I need a, a bigger pad up at the top, then we can do two separates. Okay. Both of these are the heads up, just how you configure it really. Um, this is a, a really good example of it working quite well with a a little passive, you know, um, passive loss of head control. This is a, a little girl down in Victoria. Um, this actually works quite well. He's got a lot of tone. Um, one of the people that I've worked with in Japan uh, just gave him that sort of trunk, that um, those opposing forces to really get good control there, um, which then allowed him better control of, of his arms so they could actually drive his power chair. So both of those were um, really good solutions for these guys in a more active or a more passive um, head position. Okay. Another young lady that really lost her head more um, laterally, um, but the heads up gave her not only that lateral support, but also for the loss of head control forward that anterior support. And then just a couple case studies before we um, look at some of the product here behind me. I'm sure if you've been to some of these webinars before, you've seen this gentleman in this head position. He's a great example of how I can't look at that head position until I sort this out, until I sort this out. And we gotta get rid of a little bit of that tone. So for him, it was all about the angles of the wheelchair. It was about um, creating a tilt in space for him. It was about creating a more flexion moment, 
remember we saw some slides earlier about um, creating that flexor moment. We want to have a high backrest. We want to have a little bit more of a um, uh, backwards pull to that seat belt so we can promote pelvis neutral and maybe a little bit posterior. We want the arms a little bit lower. And then we have some success at getting that, that head into a more um, midline alignment. And for him, this was a really big change. So we had to um, create some adjustability within the system. So we went for the adjust a plush and in the large size here. And the adjust a plush is what I'll use if I have a client that I'm not sure what they're gonna to tolerate. I'm pretty sure there's gonna be change. We're gonna incrementally improve that head position as there's hinges on either side so that I can bring those wings in or out to manage the current head position, but then easily change it. That has worked really, really well for him, okay? The adjust a plush in what we call the standard size. And this little guy, obviously, um, deviation in rotation, deviation forward towards the end of the day as he gets fatigued, has really no postural support in the stroller. We get him out and we see there's lots of asymmetries, there's some rotation happening and rotation happening. Again, we sort out what we can do with the pelvis accommodating what we can't change. So we had some tight hamstring issues. We had an obliquity issue. We had a pelvic rotation issue. So make sure that you're accommodating those holding them. And then we can look, wow, we've got a much better uh, midline trunk position. Give some lateral thoracic support there. And then we needed um, some real uh, positional components here, suboccipitally, to give that um, rotation on either side and some lateral components to offer this nice head position. I'll show you from the um, sagittal view here. You can see he's got a suboccipital, um, two separate ones. So left versus right need to be rotated just a little bit to, um, differently than one another. Um, the occipital pad to hold that head position. And then he actually has some lateral um, positioners that are holding that head position. Um, sort of combination of temporal and frontal. And then he also has, go back to the frontal picture again, hard to see because of uh, blocking out his face, but he also has an anterior head support because he, um, he really did um, lose his head control forward, especially towards the end of the day. But a really nice solution for him, um, hopefully retraining those muscles, making them um, better able, you know, getting a nice length relationship and maybe make them a little bit able to contract, maybe his, improve his head control um, as he gets older, okay? But really good example of, you know, I sort of got to, we very much have to sort out the pelvis and the trunk before you can even think about that head position. Again, from this side view, still working on his arms. See his arm dresses aren't on the chair yet. And again, letting the, um, you know, sort of the feet, the lower extremities be where they need to be so that we can have that pelvis in a nice position. Okay, I'm gonna um, bring you to some products here. So what I'd like you to do is, is maybe move to your full screen um, uh, for your video. And um, I'll show you what we have in terms of products. I'm going to put on a yellow vest just because it'll be easier to see me. And in terms of the head mount, this is the Lynx. I said that I really like this system. If I need durable, easy to adjust, and then I like the links too, which I'll have an extra linkage so that I can go really far forward. I can go really far forward and really far down. Um, that will allow me just the adjustability, the durability, and really quite good looks um, in that system. Now each of these mounts will have, you can put whatever sort of pad that you want on there. So that's the links mount. And here is um, the axis mount. I said I like this one because it's very, very adjustable. I can spin that forward 
so that I can have lots of adjustability forward. You can also see that it will angle. I could also do an offset. So if I have a head position that's really to one left side or the right side, the axis mount gives me that adjustability. I have all the angle adjustability as well. Length adjustability. And then obviously height adjustability will come through here. The only thing to consider with the axis mount, especially if I have it all the way mounted forward, is that I may have a lot of that stem um, poking out the back of the headrest, uh, the back of the wheelchair, really. Okay, now that can always be removed, but if you want it back to adjust for later on, a couple of years, things change. Um, if you cut it off, it won't be there. Okay, um, so that's the axis. This is the Cobra, and um, the Cobra is really nice and slim, nothing sticking out the back. So a lot of carers like that. It's easy to get close to the client. And then the Cobra is also what we make in our flip back version. And so there's just a release pin here, push that, and then the whole headrest pad will um, flip back. So you have easy transfer for the client. Okay. But meanwhile, you won't forget the headrest behind because it's staying on the chair. Okay. Has lots of adjustability here, has some adjustability, lots of adjustability here, and also some rotation there. And then again, what other, whatever pad you want to put on top of it. Okay, so those are the mounts that I've discussed. If we then look at the pads, um, if we just want a um, headrest for transport, or we just want posterior support that's nice, soft, they can rest, maybe you just want it for a head support when they're tilting, I would suggest the plush. Now the plush comes in a small size. We've got it mounted onto this. Comes in a small size, we call that an eight inch. Comes in a 10 inch. So this is really what I like for my adult clients. Um, gives them support, like maybe if they just need it for tilt. If I need a little bit more support, like I have a little bit of a lateral positioning need for just a larger head, you can do the 14. We will also do a big, what I call a radar dish. That's the 19 inch plush. If you have somebody that wraps their head around a pad and you wanna stop that from happening, we'll also make the plush in that larger size. Um, one of the great things about Whitmire is that um, it's really durable. It's gonna last forever. But let's say they rub their head on the fabric and they, they're sort of, this this um, needs to be replaced. So you can just get a new cover. Or if they press on their headrest a lot, you can just get a pad, okay? So all these are replaceable because this is gonna last forever, the shell, the shape to the actual pad. Okay. Um, back to that head rubbing, rubbing, breaking all their hair off. Um, our normal pad is what we call the lycra. It's just a nice stretchable fabric, but you could do in a vinyl. So like a reverse, sorry, a reverse dark text is a better name for that. So it's just not going to break the hair. This is more um, wipeable too. If you have um, saliva, food, a lot of sweating happening. Okay. Or you can also do a fleece covering okay so if um if you have you need other fabrics those are available independent of what type of pad you're talking about um show an example of the adjust the plush i'll show you this one because it's loose so again it's that same plushy sort of pad but now i have hinges so that i can adjust and lock in a position. So if I want a little bit more correction on the right, just move the head over a little bit, or I need it narrower. This is in what we call the narrow version, so more appropriate for kiddos. Um, I could also do it in um, a standard size, or now this is the large size. And this is the um, example that I used in the case earlier. Okay. So how I had him is I had one side really coming in so I could correct that lateral position. Okay. So with the adjust a plush, just use your Allen key. 
and you can tighten down that location. Okay. There we go. Pretty aggressive there, hey? Okay. Um, all of these bits are interchangeable. So if I want to take this pad off and put on another pad, I just use my same Allen key and take this pad off and put on another one. Okay. Um, we also talking about families fiddling. We have caps so that they can't see that those Allen keys are underneath there. So they're less likely to just make minor adjustments. Okay. Also, this is a ball and socket joint. So I've got it loose here now so that I can do some rotations. I can offset or I could even scoop that head position. Okay. And all the pads and all the mounts work exactly the same. There'll be a ball and socket here. You'll have your height and your fore aft, even your rotation or your um, left right adjustment within the mount, and then the pad rotational movement at that ball and socket. Okay. And um, probably goes without saying, but these are going to mount onto whatever type of solid backrest. So this is a mount, it'll be attached. Sorry, receiver is really what you should call that. This will be mounted onto the backrest. I just slide it in and we're good to go. Okay. This is the Cobra flip back. So I would be able to keep it on the chair, flip it out of the way when I don't need it. Okay. And then if I get a little bit more um, complicated with my head position or I want to be a little bit more positioning, I tend to um, try first if it's a pretty midline head position. I'll go for what we call the contour cradle. And this is a small one, but we would make it in small, medium, and large. We also make this in infant size. Same ball and socket, so same approach. But now it's a more um, high resiliency foam. So hopefully you can see that a little bit denser foam because I'm more positioning. I want to get in there a little bit um, closer. And then this is really trying to cradle those suboccipital pieces, get those where you want them, and then offer the occipital support. Okay. So again, I want to keep it away from the TMJ or the mastoid. I keep it away from the ears, from the jaw, and then it's just going to support me both suboccipitally and occipitally. But in a more simple headrest, they don't have multiple pieces that might need realignment over time. Okay. So simpler maybe for families. This is a nice um, solution if somebody's got, you know, head that droops to the side and you're losing um, support posteriorly, but you can achieve midline because you know, it's pretty symmetric. Okay. In multiple sizes, that's a little guy. If I then um, have a head that's more um, asymmetric, I can't come to midline, or I need different places for those pads to be to create midline, then that's when you might go for um, either a three pad system or um, a two pad system where you have suboccipital and occipital separate from one another. So I'm gonna use my same Allen key. Somebody's thrown that on. And so first thing you're going to want to do for these, you know, do your simulation, figure out where your hands are, where you want those pads to be, and then you'll choose your suboccipital, these pads, the size. The ones I have here on the demo are our big ones, okay? So for an adult, maybe a, um, a guy with a bigger neck, but we also make them in much smaller, so um, not as long. Hope we're all still with me. I just the system told me that I was muted. You're good. Uh, the system told me I was muted. I don't know why. Um, so if I have um, a smaller child, I can have a, a smaller or even stubby, what I call system. And then I'm going to be able to really rotate these to be where I need them to be. I'll turn to the side, keep it in front of me a little bit. 
Okay, so I can grab that suboccipitally. And then I also have an occipital pad that has adjustment for an aft and up and down so that I can get that head position really where I want it to be, where I need to support that occipital portion. Again, this is in sort of our adult version, but we would make it in a smaller version as well. Okay. And I still have all that rotation at the pad itself. So that I can get those pads exactly where I need them to be. I don't know if you know the history of the Whitmire headrest, but it was an occupational therapist in, um, in the U.S. and America that said a long time ago now, he said, I just need a headrest that does this. I just want to be able to cup the head like this. Why doesn't anybody make it? And so he made it. And it's been part of Sunrise's portfolio for lots of years and expanded, but that's really where um, the headrest started from. Is, hey, I just, I just need to replace my hands with the thing. Okay, hence this three pad or what we call the soft system. Remember that you can get gel in these pads. You could get fleece fabric in it for the covers. Okay? Or you could get it in that um, reversed Artex um, material if you need it to be wipeable. Okay? One last thing we'll talk about here is what if I need lateral positioners or even anterior positioners? And you can add those systems by adding sort of a swing away mount. It's gonna add like a rector set just to my system here or onto a plush pad. You can add, remember we're building what we need. And then it's on a swing away bracket so it can swing away from the system and then add that positional piece wherever I need it. I can have a long pad. I could have a short round pad. The whole idea would be that it's offering that support where I need it to be. Whether I want to add it to, took my cover off. Whether I want to add it to a single plush pad or whether I want to add it to um, a multi-pad system. Okay, again, using the component tree that's within the head pad itself, can add one other pad and then add the swing away. Okay. Put that on my forehead again. Okay. So that would be sort of lateral, lateral temporal. Last but not least, if I wanted to add one of those anterior straps, here I have an example of a strap being put into a cap. I can add it to whichever system. Use an example of my three pad system. It'll go onto the mounting bracket there, and then my head cap. Basically what that's doing is offering, and now tool, tool time Amy, offering that anterior support that's now going to be attached to my head support, to the pad, whatever's there. I'll still be able to rotate, but I just will have that anterior support helping me with um, anterior sort of forces. Okay. Remember that trial is really important in headrests. So we've got a whole bucket of this stuff. If you've got a client that you really think you can get better head positioning for, give us a call, give your supplier a call. Um, we can go out and, and trial some of these systems, send them to you so that you can trial them. Okay. Thanks guys, have a great day. Um, we'll talk to you soon, bye.